you know, I, I love the fact that you can beat anyone. Your, your team, like being a Canadian Canadian rugby player, going in every game, we, we expect to win. And you might not say that in, in other sports or in other, in other codes. I think that's, you know, a huge appeal. Today's guest is more elusive than Bigfoot. He has played in five Rugby World Cups, representing Canada in sevens at the World Cup in Moscow 2013 and San Francisco in 2018, and in 15, so 2007, 2011 and 2015 Rugby World Cups. He's toured the world for almost 15 years on the HSBC World Rugby 7 Series, and is the third highest point scorer of all time. The prestigious top three include the great Ben Gollings from England and New Zealand's playmaker Tomasi Thama. He is also 7th in the world for most tournaments played, 79 events. In today's episode, which was recorded during April 2020, during the early stages of lockdown, we chat about Nate's childhood, his mentors and coaches, wearing the Canadian 7th jersey at just 18 years of age, and his experiences at three different Rugby World Cups. We look at advice he would impart on younger players, how he managed to last like an action hero on the series, favourite tries, highlights representing his country, and of course best and worst roommates on tour. One of his greatest honours lies await, captaining Canada at the 2021 Olympic Games in Japan. Here is Canadian legend Nate Hirayama. He's so dangerous, Freddy Krueger has nightmares about him! Hello and welcome to the Rugby Hive. I'm Dallin Stanford and despite my South African accent, I was fortunate enough to play rugby for the United States on the Sevens World Series. And I'm Robin McDowell, a former Canadian Sevens International. Back in my playing days, I went head-to-head -head against Dallin and the USA. For several years, Robin has coached International Sevens for various countries, including Canada and Mexico. He's massively passionate about growing the game across the Americas through his McDowell Rugby programs at all levels. I'm currently a commentator for World Rugby, most recently broadcasting the Rugby World Cup in Japan, as well as the amazing Sevens World Series. More than a decade later, we are teaming up to bring you insights from legendary players and coaches from around the world. All legends have a story. The Rugby Hive podcast is here to share it. Welcome to the Hive. Oh, it's more dangerous than climate change. Hello and welcome to episode 14. One of the greatest Canadians ever to step on the rugby field. No, it's not called or Robert McDowell, but the stepping feet of Nate Hirayama. I remember many a battle between our USA side and Canada on the HSBC World Rugby 7 Series. And Hirayama was an integral part of the enemy. A brilliant stepper, wonderful distribution, excellent vision. And this stat alone, I think, third top point scorer in history behind the great Ben Gollings from England and New Zealand's Tomasi Thama says it all. So many highlights featuring Nate over the years. But well, my favorite from this episode actually is when he reveals one of your nicknames, Robin, known as the <laughs> Ferrets. It always be a gold. Uh, classic. Well, I'm glad I was able to publicly air out how Sluggo Rick Sudgett uh, threw me under the bus. But, you know, I, I'm a little bit tickled through the whole episode emotionally because, you know, my heart has always been as a coach and, and seeing talent. I was in my second year on the circuit when Nate came along at 18 at the University of Victoria. He had flow for days. So we'll, we'll share some pictures of that. Even in the interview, he's, he's class and he's mature. And, and as a young 18-year-old walk on to the University of Victoria, and then a few months into the school year, he's on tour on the World 7 Series playing against New Zealand in the Cup quarterfinal. It's just incredible. But we knew at that time that he was going places. And you got this shy, quiet, respectful, young player, you know, teenager on the World Series, fresh out of high school. And we're literally like, can we get your autograph now? And he'd be like, shut up guys. But we knew he was destined for great things. And, uh, you know, to now being 15 years later, he's still playing. He's still on form most recently at the Vancouver sevens where you were commentating and he's still loving his life and having fun. So for me, that's the best part. And, uh, if I can wish anything for my athletes at any level, any stage or anyone is, is to make sure you're enjoying it. And that's his number one message uh, on, on this episode. And sharing on the socials this week, it's just so cool to find that photo from Canada's 2017 win, the very first ever cup final victory on the Sevens World Series, Singapore celebrating. And that was just so cool to see that. And it's rare that you get to see, you know, whether it's it's the USA from years gone by. Obviously, in recent times, they've won, won a lot of tournaments or Canada, you know, and you've got to celebrate those brilliant moments. I mean, mentally for North Americans, I think USA winning was was a lift for Canada, although we're rivals. Uh, it's like, yes, we can in this part of the world. And the best part about that was not, I won't say beating the U.S. Uh, in Singapore, because that's not really the, you know, what we want. But the fact that there's two North American sides in a cup final 
halfway across the world and uh, fighting to the death. So that for me was really uplifting. And of course, the women are always in the top three or four as well. You know, Nate's stories about talking about his, his favorite roommates, it's, it's from his early days and, and his, you know, all time favorite player, which will be revealed in the episode again, was from his first season on the tur- circuit. So lots of respect for for us old guys uh, down the way. He's now leading the next generation as Canadians and uh, it's, you know, passing the torch, you know, typically transition on as a professional athlete is one or two seasons. And, and he's been like with players like Patrick K, he's been passing the torch to Patrick since he was 19. Patrick's now 27. So for six, seven years, he's learned under one of the best players of all time. And uh, again, he's, he's so humble. And so speaking of passing on the torch, what is happening in your world, my friend? More rugby, more rugby. Fortunate to get on the field with uh, legendary Henry Paul last week and do some skills with the men's seven side. And, and we're just, you know, working on their, their kicking right now. Develop, you know, with no competitions on the horizon and needing to recover from injuries, we got to develop some different skills. And uh, yeah, just a few of my projects on the go here uh, locally in, in Canada. How about, how about on your side? Yeah, pal, getting almost as busy as the ferret, consulting for Friends of the British Council and Premiership Rugby on that wonderful initiative that sends rugby coaches to England for an immersive coach experience. And obviously COVID happened, we pushed the pause button and we can take a group though, we just spoke but in about a year's time. So the fall next year, end, end of next year, and coaches can take part now, not just from the US, it can be from anywhere in the world, which I think is really exciting. We have a huge interest from Canada as well, so that, that's really great. We know we're going to get you on that trip also when you're available. So that's been really fun. And then the really cool news this week as well, I just joined the Dynamo Sports Travel as the USA ambassador for the British and Irish Lions Tour to South Africa 2021. They have a brilliant range of ticket-inclusive packages. So, of course, anybody outside of the Lions territories, which is the EU and the UK, they can contact me for an epic tour. It's going to be sensational. There's going to be gates being shut. There's going to be champagne being funneled. There's going to be change being kept. So please message me on, get me on email if you want. Dallin, that's D-A-L-L-E-N at dynamosportstravel.com. And we are going to have a blast in the Republic of Africa. We should get you on that tour as well. Obviously, we hope it's going to be COVID-free, my friend. What do you say? I'm into it. I just want to know who's paying for your jars because I couldn't afford that. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's going to be very affordable, my friend. It's going to be a uh, few cents for a cold one. And then uh, let's crack on through the shout outs and thank yous. Is the news spoiler alert that you're making a comeback? You'll be back <laughs> on the field. <laughs> That's part of my thank yous and, and shout outs. <laughs> that, would, that would sell out anywhere. That would sell out anywhere because I want to see those gloves back on. If you're going to call me old nicknames, I want to see the magic hands Well done. Again. Well done, my friend. Well done. You got me in the end. A couple shout outs for me is uh, legendary uh, Canadian international Kayla Mack that's on maternity leave from playing just had a, a beautiful baby girl she was back on the field coaching at the Mac Dual Rugby Academy in Saskatchewan. Kayla continues to inspire the next generation of Canadian Prairie kids in, in her old stomping grounds. And uh, just a shout out this week, uh, Frank and Aaron Jones. Frank's about six foot seven. He's got a brother that's six foot nine. He's played a lot of rugby uh, for me and, and my programs over the years. And he's, he's got a nice little family in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Brandon, Manitoba. So he has no experience of farming and now he's a full-time rancher. And uh, his wife, Aaron just wrote a kid's book during COVID to inspire uh, young mothers and kids out there so special shout out to that that rugby now uh, Canadian farming family and then lastly on my side just want to uh, send one of our number one supporters uh, Karen Gasparino in Ontario a big happy birthday today uh, we love all you do for the game across Canada she's a big supporter of the MLR big supporter of the arrows and uh, and probably our number one podcast supporter so all the best Karen from uh, from the rugby hive Yeah, that's brilliant. I want to extend my my wishes to Karen as well. She's a sleek sensation of note. We look forward to celebrating with her when we finally get done in your guys' neck of the woods. But again, a brilliant birthday. And then thank yous on this side. We want to thank our partners, Gilbert Rugby Canada, Brand Marinade, Yeti, and Focus Care Products. A rugby friend of mine recently started his own wellness business, and that you should check them out there, focuscareproducts.com. And you can get 25% off your first purchase there as well. So let the good times roll. Make sure to follow us at Rugby Hive on Twitter and Facebook at My Rugby Hive on Insta. Time now for episode number 14. Nate, thanks so much for joining us, my friend. How are you managing that side during this strange new world we're living in? Thanks for having me, guys. Um, yeah, I'm managing all right. I guess uh, just like everyone else here, kind of taking it one day at a time, trying to stay busy, trying to keep fit, but uh, extremely grateful for all those kind of on the front line working hard for us and um yeah we just kind of have to chill out and do our part you know how are you guys doing 
Uh, we're doing good. I'm busy trying to keep kids going across uh, across a few countries here online, so I, I'm adapting that way. And just one of the questions some of the kids had are, what are you doing to keep fit and keep active and stay on top of your, your skills? I like the uh, little self-promo there with all the kit you got on there, Ferret. <laughs> Looks good, man. You got to send that my way. I'm a poster um, boy for myself. What am I doing to keep fit? I guess I'm, yeah, obviously there's no public gyms or anything open where none of the boys are training together in terms of like in like a gym or anything like that. I know a few of the guys are meeting for runs and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm trying to just run, run a, like at least once a day and uh, lift whatever weights I can, I can find. And um, yeah, just try to keep the body fit and loose. And, uh, and there was obviously some niggles coming out of Vancouver for a lot of the guys and we weren't able to get physio. I know that was kind of a, that was kind of working out a physio appointment via Skype, which was uh kind of a new uh a new thing for for us but um yeah just trying to feel good and man it's tough because we don't really know what the plan is here and when we're gonna when we're expected to be back or what kind of the near future looks like so we're just kind of trying to stay fit and keep positive I guess now just rewinded back you made your debut on the uh, sevens world series way back in 2006 the youngest Canadian sevens ever at the international stage tell us what was it like running out there as an 18 year old I think that's actually been B. I think Taylor Paris is now the youngest. So there's been some other young guys now. But um, what I remember from 2006, I remember just being so pumped to be there. I remember um, going to the tryout in 2006 and not not really expecting to make the team. And then then making the team, I was you know static. I couldn't I couldn't believe it. I was playing with these guys that I watched on TV and uh, idols of mine. And to run out there, I remember being pretty nervous. I remember my first game was against New Zealand. I didn't play on day one in Dubai. I don't know if Robin remembers because Robin was there. I didn't play on day one, but then I got in on day two. We were, we were losing to New Zealand in the cup quarters, and I, that was my first uh, first cap. It was one of those years where Dubai had the uh, torrential downpour. It was like crazy rain. You know how it happens there every once in a while? Yeah, no, one of my one of my favorite memories from, from playing for sure over the years. You've played different sports. Can you give us an insight as to, as a youngster, what kind of activities did you enjoy? Yeah, I, as a youngster, I mean, I was just kind of probably like most kids in Canada. I was playing all the different kinds of sports. I was playing hockey. I played baseball until I was 18. I played soccer until I was 18. I uh, didn't really choose rugby at any, I was never really like one, a one sport guy. A lot of kids now are doing the sport specialization stuff at a young age. I know there's a lot of talk about that, but always doing something, playing sports, being outside. And I guess when I turned like 18, that's kind of when I got really into, I mean, I was into rugby before that, but that's kind of when I knew that's what I really wanted to pursue and go to school for it. Awesome. And I see you've been on the boat with your dad a bit. So how's the fishing been so far? Just prawn and crabbing or? Yeah, well, there's no retention here for uh, Chinook. So we're not, uh, we're not keeping any, we're not keeping any fish. We're not even dropping fishing lines right now. We're just prawning and crabbing just on nice days. We're not messing with shitty weather or anything like that. We're just kind of getting out there having a coffee, man. It's not a bad place to isolate in beautiful BC here out on a boat. How about you? You've been out, Ferret? Yeah, I've been out a couple of times so far with my dad. Uh, I've got the boat ready and kind of over the last month. So obviously I've relocated from the prairies and everybody's still dealing with snow in the heartland of Saskatchewan. And uh, I'm out here getting a suntan and, and reeling in some, some yeah, prawns and crabs. So it's, eh? it's been good to, to reconnect with my dad. Yeah. It's been, been awesome being back on the coast. So just to take it back for one second there, like on your trap, on your, on your boat, you have the prawn pulleys. Do you have a pulley? Yeah, we got a pull. Oh, man, we he's not down with the pulleys, so we have to pull him up. We have to pull up the prawn traps from the bottom of the ocean, like 300 feet. Uh, so there's your there's your there's your workout. isolation workout. Yeah, there's my workout. Arms are uh, as good as they've ever been. Oh man, you got to invest. You got to invest. No, he's not down. He's not down. So I've been trying to talk. How to many? How many? Years. How many traps do you guys go down? Because if you got a couple, it's one thing. But down. Oh yeah, just... we got two. We got two on each line, so we're pulling up like eight. Four, we got four each, right? Is what yeah. you're allowed to have, and it's yeah, it's, it's hell. But no, it's as uh, it's good of a workout as as I'm getting. I was telling Dallin before we jumped on the call about uh, the legend of Gary Hiriyama, and actually after. Uh, Nate's first trial with the sevens team I got on a ferry boat ride with the Hiriyamas I didn't know who Gary was I didn't really know too much about Nate but uh, I knew he had a lot of talent coming out of high school he's the first year at the University of Victoria and uh, anyhow I needed a ride so I jumped in with the Hiriyama family in the back of, I think it was an old Ford pickup for those those on the west coast in Seattle or Vancouver like the ferry you live and die by the ferry and we were the last it was like Thanksgiving weekend I and mean, we were the last vehicle on, so it was like we won the World Cup right there. Gary was asking me if I'd been to Hong Kong. At the time, I didn't know that he was on the the first side that ever went to the Hong Kong 7. So we connected about that. And I guess, Nate, like, what kind of influence has, has your dad been? Obviously, he's a very influential guy. 
uh, in the last 10, 15 years since I met him. I've talked to many of his former students and former players and what's it like having a legend of a dad, but also just such a, a common influence like Gary Hiriyama in your life. He's obviously extremely supportive of me and, and my career as a younger guy. A lot of people are like, oh, a lot of people assume that I was kind of pushed to play rugby just because he played rugby. But I think I, I didn't start playing rugby till high school and I wouldn't have probably played rugby had I not gone to that school and just kind of fell in love with it there. And uh, no, he would have supported me whether I chose to play, pursue hockey or football or whatever, whatever I wanted to do. And it just so happened that we kind of fell in love with the same game and uh a cool experience for me seeing him kind of reconnect with a lot of his buddies who he may have not have seen for a while, especially in like Vancouver and stuff. And him and my mom come and come to a few of the tournaments around the world. They've been to Hong Kong a few times and Singapore and come down to the Vegas and uh, not LA yet, but um, yeah, it's cool. It's running into his old pals and just the kind of the rugby community and how everyone bonds. It's just like you guys here, you know, you guys played against each other what a decade ago and now you guys got a podcast together. It's kind of those bonds kind of last forever. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool seeing that uh, side of it for, for him. And it's, uh, it's a cool thing for sure. Well, Nate, you're part of a rare breed, right? Having your father play such high level rugby as well and yourself too. So I know if I was to ever have any kids and they were to play sports, you know, that would be really cool to see them. Now, what other mentors and coaches over your career have had a big influence? Uh, mentors and coaches, man, I've had, uh, I've been so lucky. I've had so many great coaches, even just in high school and stuff with, you know, Al Smith and uh, shout out to Al Smith and, um, you know, going to UVic, playing under Dougie Tate and Ricker and Shane are giving me a shot at a young age. Yeah, like there's been, there's been too many to name. I've been, I've been extremely blessed with, with all the coaches and, and mentors and I keep in touch with most of them. And yeah, everyone's different. Obviously, everyone's got a different style and different kind of perspective on the game. But I think as a player, being exposed to those different perspectives and, and styles and personalities is good for is good for you and helps you kind of grow as a player and it, it kind of forces you to look at look at things a bit differently too. And who did you admire growing up? Who were some of your heroes as rugby players? The first kind of rugby I really remember watching. I remember watching it when I was younger. I remember watching like Law Move and stuff, but I was really young at that time. But I remember kind of really getting more into watching it probably around like the two thousand three World Cup, maybe just before that. And I was big into like I used to love Larkham from Oz. I used to love uh, Wilco, obviously. I remember staying up late with my, my buddy Dolly while watching that final and watching Wilco hit the, the winner. And, you know, Carlos Spencer, I'm loving his, uh, I'm loving his um, TikTok videos or whatever he's putting out now with the trick shots and the guy's still got the skills. So it's kind of like that generation of the guys that I really loved watching. And I mean, after that, obviously Carter and those guys were, uh, were definitely guys I looked up to as well. I remember um, before I would have been in grade 12 or something, so 17, 18. I think it was Sportsnet used to play the Canada games on the weekends, the Sevens games. And that was kind of my first exposure to Sevens. So they would just play the Canada games and then the Cup Final. So if Canada wasn't in the Cup Final, they'd play that. And I thought it was – that's how I kind of got into watching Sevens and playing Sevens. I thought it was an awesome thing. I, I don't know why we don't do that anymore. I think, I think it's a great way to get kids in Canada into it anyways because we don't really have the, all the exposure here. And kids want to play what they, what they see, right? You, you kind of – that's how you kind of get into things. That's why – I wanted to play hockey growing up because that's what I'd see. I'd see hockey and basketball and things like that. But I remember watching it and being like, man, this, this is sweet. And this is just kind of like an abbreviated version of what I'm doing right now. And these guys are in all these cool places and all this stuff. And then a year later, you're on the world stage. So how about 15s? What are some of your memories from your first debut, your first test cap in Portugal? Yeah, I know. It's funny because... Yeah, that was my first test cap, but I actually got I've got two caps. I got two I got two fifteens, first fifteens caps because they they changed the rules just as I kind of came in. I remember they used to give out caps for like A games and stuff like that when you were playing for Canada. So my first I got given a cap after the New Zealand New Zealand Maori game in two thousand seven. It was a Churchill Cup and we're in the UK and that was my first cap. Uh, I remember going out with the boys and <laughs> having a good time after that. And everyone was super excited for me because I remember going on the tour, not expecting to play. And um, Sluggo gave me a shot in that one. Yeah, I guess my, I, I, did, I went to the World Cup and didn't play in that World Cup. So I didn't, uh, I didn't get a cap there. Over a year later, where I got my first kind of official cap with uh, the men's team in Portugal. We went on that tour. We played Portugal, Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. Yeah, and it was a great time. At that point, there was quite a few younger guys coming into the mix. I remember Mevins, it was kind of me, Mevins, Phil McKenzie, those kind of guys were, were getting our kind of first caps around then. So great memories. I still talk to Lean Squad, Phil McKenzie about those tours and definitely fond memories. Well, in, in that time, we didn't have too many fly halves coming through. And then we had you, Mevins, uh, Harry Jones, 
goal kicking, fly half skills to pay the bills. That first kind of wave of Canadian uh, young internationals coming through that had skills to pay the bills. Like before that, it was it was all us hockey players that made the the conversion. And and when you guys come through, it was like you guys actually the Pat K's and some other guys. But there's been a pile. There's been you, Harry, and and then again the PKs and stuff after you that I thought could have been some of the best fly halves ever to play for Canada. You arguably, I would put you in that mix for a guy that hasn't played much 15s in the last 10 years. I, I think we've kind of missed the boat on, on a few of those guys, but I, I don't blame you for, for kind of choosing the, the sevens route at all. Well, I appreciate that, man. That's too kind. I don't know if I'd put myself in there, but um, yeah, I think uh, the sevens for myself, I just kind of fell in love with the sevens game, the tour and the series and everything to do with it. And the, the Olympic kind of carrot there is uh, really enticing. Yeah, no, you're right. We haven't played a lot of 15s. I haven't, I'm not, I barely played 15s in between the last two World Cups and the one before that. Barely played before that as well. So it's been an interesting journey, and I think Rugby Canada is trying to do things to to change that for for guys coming up. You know, they'll have a bit more of an opportunity to get the reps in at whatever code they're trying to pursue. And um, yeah, I think uh, the Pacific Pride and, and all that is is a great thing. And I could see a lot of those guys kind of putting their hands up in the next. 18 months here if there is if there is any competitions going on in 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 the world of rugby uh, or any in any sport yeah i could see a lot of those guys kind of in the mix in sevens and 15s Matt, let's go back a little bit i want to get your take you've been to three rugby world cups for the 15 aside game as you said you didn't feature in 2007 you were there with the team 2011 you got probably a couple games off the bench but then you started in 2015 all four games what were your experiences like over those three different tournaments you know because obviously it's, it's such a remarkable stage i would imagine yeah no the uh, 2007 when i was i remember actually we we're doing a tour across canada before the final before the final selections and um they had 31 guys on tour and I was one of them and I knew everyone knew one guy was going to be cut. Right. I remember Sluggo called me into his room and he actually told me I was, I was going to be left out and I assumed so I was obviously pretty disappointed, but I knew I was kind of on the bubble there. I was going to be one of those guys in consideration to be cut. And I was obviously disappointed, but um, he allowed me to stick down with the team until the team took off for the world cup. I guess he had a name in a couple of weeks before the team traveled to, uh, to France one of our last games on the tour, we were doing a tour across Canada playing like BC and Ontario and things like that. It's kind of our prep. Nowadays, it would be a lot more professional than that. And we're playing the um, the Newfoundland Rock. And unfortunately, Kevin Tkachuk, one of the, I think it was our tight head, one of our props, who's a veteran of the team and one of the leaders in the team had an injury. And I guess Sluggo decided to, instead of bringing someone else in, he had felt he had enough prop cover. So he kept he kept the fly half on. And I'm not really sure how, how that worked. He brought... He kept a fly half on for, for a prop injury but um no I was extremely lucky to, to go on that tour and yeah being there I mean it was it was amazing I remember walking through the airport and I was walking beside Mike Mike James and, and Jamie and those guys were already kind of studs in France at the time and seeing the way people were in Paris and seeing the way people looked at Mike and, and talked to Mike I was like holy smokes I'm with like you know like some serious celebs here those guys they wouldn't even leave the hotel because there's too many people were coming up to them that was a great team that 2007 team there's a lot of shoulda coulda would is over the over the last three or four world cups for Canada and I think that's that was one of those teams man I, I really think that tournament could have gone you know a different way for us we ran Wales right to the bitter end Fiji scored a length of the field try with just a couple minutes left to beat us and Japan tied us because Morgs did the old push the ball to the back of the end zone thing I remember chirping him on that I still talk to him about that but now he was uh Morgan Williams was amazing player that tournament shout out to Morgs who's uh assistant coach of the women's team and then yeah going four years later we fair it said I think I was just at I was at UVic during these this time and was kind of playing sevens and a bit of 15s and yeah I got a bit more game time there I was playing behind Ander most of that world cup that was another amazing experience in New Zealand. A lot of good memories from that. And then four years later in England, who did a fantastic job hosting, got a bit more playing time and it was yeah, super enjoyable. And yeah, it is the biggest stage. You know, I think Japan did a fantastic job running this past one other than the monsoon stuff that was out of anyone's control. I think all the World Cups that I've been involved with have just been amazing. So what do you love about 15s and what do you love about sevens? And give us on record your favorite one and why. <laughs> What's your favorite one? <laughs> I'm going to go sevens. I'm going to go sevens. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's only because uh, I can't get through some of those uh, loose forwards. I think obviously 15s was my first love because we didn't really play sevens when I was, when I was a kid. I know it's a, lot, a lot's changed since, since then. And kids in high school now are playing a lot more sevens in Canada. Yeah, I think what I liked about sevens, I really liked the kind of the kicking aspect and the kicking game when I was a kid. I liked the 80-minute games. I liked kind of the chess game involved with it. I like, especially as a fly half, trying to move the team around the field and kind of looking at the game from that perspective. But then when I kind of 
when I made the sevens team and I was kind of exposed more to sevens, I think I just kind of fell in love with the the space and time you have in sevens. You know, I, I love the fact that you can beat anyone. Your your team, like being a Canadian Canadian rugby player, going in every game, we we expect to win. And you might not say that in in other sports or in other in other codes. I think that's you know a huge appeal for me and and the boys is when you when you work as hard as we do at something, you want to be taken seriously at it. And you want the respect that that comes with it, and uh, you want to work hard and and have those results and those have the ability to win any game. And um, yeah, that's kind of a huge huge thing for me going back uh you've been calling me a name that i don't i don't hear too often anymore and i don't even know if you know the full story but uh i kind of it's kind of a two-part two-part question i guess or two-part statement going back to sluggo so R- the late rick sudget he uh he coached canadian women's sevens uh men's sevens i think maybe 15s for both before he relocated to the u.s and coached the the women's uh, the women eagles before the last olympics after helping them qualify and then relocated to the U of L, the Lethbridge university side before he passed away tragically a couple of years ago but he was about as canadian as it gets he was a big influence in my life he cut me for like five six years before i made it but he was also my biggest fan like he would have long you'd have a long list canadian sevens team and then you'd have a short list and then you'd have a traveling and, a, and with a couple non-travelers and in the year of the 2005 world cup in like my sixth or seventh year of trying out he brought me along the whole way he was loyal i just I just did everything. And the nickname that he's throwing out, I think I have a nickname with every team and every sport I played like most guys. The ferret is a name that Sluggo gave me in a drill and, and Sluggo would get pretty excited. He, he'd be classic for the three hour sessions in the rain and two a day. So you do about six, seven hours of training for seven days in a row. We were up at Shawnee and Lake school and the guys were getting the drill wrong. It was a diamond formation. You're trying to beat the defense and he wanted you screaming for the ball. He wanted you to run to space. And, and anyhow, it was at the point where one more time and we're going to have another three hours of training, you you know, I was just a, a little worker bee and I did it right. And I screamed and I went through a hole and then put somebody away and then he went off and he called me a ferret and asked why I got it right. And I said, just repeat it back to him what he wanted because I did what he wanted. And then, uh, and then Dave Moonlight, our captain looked over at me and he's like the ferret. And I'm like, that's it. <laughs> and then Sluggo and I walked into the pavilion at Shawnee Lake School. And he's like, do you have any nicknames? I got, oh, I got, a, I'm not really. And he goes, well, you do now. So Sluggo's long gone, but the name is still strong. So I had to give some backstory on that awful nickname. I remember when, the, when I came in, I remember guys had like Copas on like ferrets and stuff like photoshopped on on ferrets because those were your boot and uh, yeah i don't think i don't even remember anyone calling you robin back in the day no it's 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 interesting the different names of different teams when you bump into people with your fiance and they're like what okay but yeah maybe just maybe just back up a bit about sluggo like what what kind of what kind of coach he was what kind of man he was and, and what was it like to to be around him oh man he was a great man he was uh he was an awesome guy like you said a ton of energy and uh you know a loud guy a loud coach a raw 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 kind of guy and i remember oh man i remember some of some of my favorite memories were him just freaking out on the team i remember after ever halftime of the fiji game at that 2007 world cup i wasn't playing i was in a suit but i remember going down the the change room with the boys after at halftime and i remember there were chairs being thrown and guys going off yeah, oh man, he was he was a great coach, a great guy. And I remember connecting with him a few years later, like in 2014, and we were going to grab a coffee and all that. You know, he gave me a shot and had a huge impact on my career. Well, you talk about the fact that you came in for, for T-Bone, Kevin Kachuk, uh, for that first World Cup you went to. Potentially could have taken another tight five or front row player, but he was investing in you. I think everybody knew at a young age what we had in the works. Just going back to comparing 15s, a 15s test match, compared to the world series and and for me it's always you know i never played in a test match so i i don't know what that's like how would you compare literally being on the field in the action in a world series game and being in a test match in a 15s game if you're speaking to a young kid or somebody who's never been in either of those arena what is it like yeah i know it definitely is a different mindset i know going in because the last time i played 15s was at the last world cup and i remember going into those games obviously when you play fly playmaker and sevens too you think about the game plan and stuff like that too but um even on another level when you're playing kind of a decision-making role in 15s. Obviously, you hear this comparison a lot, but I'm way more tired in a 7s game than I'm in a 15s game, even though, you know, 80 minutes versus 14. I'm assuming it probably people in different positions would have a different answer for you on this. But yeah, mine would be just kind of like the game, trying to push the game plan and, really kind of upping my comms in in the uh in the 15s game and um you know but I think there's value in playing both I really do I think playing both has kind of helped my career I'm a better player for having played both sevens and 15s yeah obviously the kicking skills and things like that they're different but but similar and yeah you see a lot of guys nowadays who who played sevens getting shots at uh 
U15s all over the world in all the different countries. So, you know, that's that's a pretty cool thing. And there were two boys in the last World Cup final in both squads that were sevens, sevens boys. So Yeah, let's, let's stick with sevens for a bit now. So you're in the tunnel, about to run out for Canada. Vancouver sevens as an example. What's going through your head? You're waiting in the tunnel. You have to be there, obviously, two minutes before kickoff. What are you thinking? Um, yeah, I'm trying to stay focused. I'm kind of my first action of the game, whether it's I know we're kicking off or I know we're receiving. That's kind of my my mindset going going out there. I try not to get too too fired up, but it's hard not it's hard not to, especially in Vancouver when when you're in the tunnel, you can kind of see that uh, that east side of the stadium there, and everyone's going nuts, and you see everyone get up on their feet, and you know the the fire the fire torches or whatever they got going there are about to get lit up, and yeah, I mean it's hard not to get too fired up, but I try to really kind of focus on what I got to do, and whether that's like kick off and I might have an idea of where I'm going based on you know preview or uh, I have an idea on where they're going on based on previous games they've kicked yeah that's kind of where I'm at in the tunnel there so you mentioned the Olympics so Tokyo now 2021 will this extra year of build up help your team is you guys who are really getting momentum the Vancouver Sevens even mentioned with a bronze medal finish yeah I mean obviously we're yeah, I'm not gonna lie I was re- re- extremely disappointed when when I first found out Canada pulled out and we were the kind, kind of the first country to pull out uh, we were extremely gutted obviously we we understand the reasoning behind it it was the right call of course it took a few days but after we took a step back from the whole thing i thought i do think this could be a good thing for our team if i'm looking from a results standpoint i think it just gives us another year to uh grow together and kind of get our game plan together and clean up some little things that we need to clean up and uh just get more time together and with the coaching staff and kind of get all on the same page i think you know the amount we've improved over the last six tournaments it's been quite a bit and i think we're one of those teams that throughout the season we get better i remember maybe like two good dubais we've done well and mm. cape town and it's definitely a bit of an excuse but i think it's we're definitely a team that we get better the more we play together i'm hoping i'm hoping that there's a, a silver line in this whole thing and come 2021 we're better prepared i think it's a positive too i mean you guys definitely been turning on the last few tournaments and ultimately you've had henry paul as a coach for a year so he's a year deep and, and more time under that regime. And uh, obviously you got some boys back from overseas and some guys uh, coming back from school like Duke and, and some different guys that you've played with a long time. And then, of course, we got a lot of young stars like Jake Teal and Joe Mora and, and young David Richards pushing through as well. So personally, I don't think the, the sides had better depth than it's ever had. You guys, you, your confidence you, you displayed in Vancouver was you just owned it, right? And outside of an inch, you guys are in the, in the big dance. I don't know when the last time you guys beat South Africa and you guys were very convincing in that, that third place final. I I appreciate that. Yeah, no, we haven't beaten them in a while. No, I agree with you. I I think our team is as deep as it's been. And I think uh, that has a lot to do with all the, all the young boys putting in work every day that you probably don't even see at this point because they're not, they're not on TV or on, you know, the websites, but those boys are out there grinding. I know they're working hard and yeah, there's a lot of talent coming up and I really think the future for uh, sevens and fifteens in Canada can be bright. If it's um, these boys are, given the opportunity to be successful, which, uh, you know, I think they will be. It's exciting. And come 2021, we're as good as we can be. I believe it will. So we're going to dial it back a bit here. Best roommate on tour and why? I think uh, I think my best roommate on tour ever, and he was my first roommate on tour, was Tony LeCart, who <laughs> at the, uh, I remember at the time I've told T since, I've told T about this since, but I remember on my first tour, I got on like really well with all the guys, but T was kind of like, uh, he wasn't like overly warm to me initially. And I think that's just kind of the way things go often with like older guys and younger guys. He just kind of wanted just thought I was some kid kind of getting a shot. Maybe he did, I don't know if he thought I was kind of on there before I should have been or whatever. I remember thinking, Oh man, I can't wait to go on this tour, but she's the only guy I don't want to room with is LeCarte. <laughs> and I go there and I'm rooming with LeCarte and the guy's just like the biggest beauty ever. He's just the man still buddies with him till today. And yeah, no, he's hands down the best roommate I've ever had on tour. He was the worst roommate I ever had. Really? Before, before I before I tell you why, I want to know. I want to know what what he was like. Did you ever wake up and see him sleep? Oh yeah, I remember we used, he always used to say he slept like he was sleeping in a coffin. Like he was like a, he had his arms like across his chest. Yeah, hands on his shoulders. I went to I went to Hong Kong the year before Nate was on tour. He's still in high school, I guess. And uh, we got we all got sick. All the teams got sick. It just went through us all. Uh, Phil Mack got sick like the lot like after the tournament and then like the whole flight to Singapore get to Singapore and then Moonlight and I are at dinner and Dave Moonlight and uh, we're sitting with some of the boys and we're, we're starting to get symptoms and we're asking the guys that like it, it would go through you in 24 hours and we're like did, did you feel like this and this and this they're like yeah you're gonna get it and then yeah 
I got it. Tony was my roommate. Otherwise, I would just passed out. I slept like a baby on two. You're always so gassed. And I woke up in the middle of the night because I was projectile vomiting. And I, I wake up to, yeah, just like he's in a casket, like arms crossed and eyes half open and mouth open. And I was just frightened for my life across the world. And uh, <laughs> I was just more scared than anything, but he's, he's a great guy. Okay, we'll skip over to who was your worst roommate on tour and why? Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, that's a tough one. That's uh, top five. Top five. <laughs> Quite a few, yeah. Man, there's not, there's not, uh, there's too many to choose. No, I'm just kidding. There's not many. I, I honestly don't know the answer to this question. I think, um, you know, who I'm going to say, and I think the boys that were on that tour will know why. I'm going to say Scotty Franklin because he was my roommate for the entire 2007 World Cup. And the boys kind of stuck me with him. But no, Scotty's a great guy. But I think uh, just living together with someone for that long, we're, we're together for like a month in France and the beds were tiny. And I think just living on top of each other kind of got, got the best of everyone. So I want to say Scotty Franklin, but hell of a guy. Hope he's doing well. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's, let's talk to uh, one of the best moments, the Singapore Sevens 2017. Can you talk about winning your first ever World Series and what that felt like? Man, it felt obviously amazing. We still talk about it often. I think, you know, I'm as motivated as ever to, to, to make it not a one-off. You know, I really want another one and another two or three or as many, however many as I can because that's kind of what drives all of us. Yeah, and I was, it was just one of those days that everything kind of went well for us. It wasn't necessarily the weekend. We didn't actually play that well on, on the Saturday. And then Sunday we kind of woke up and, man, it's a crazy game because – we weren't even feeling that good physically. I remember me and Hammond didn't even warm up with the team on day two. We were just on the bikes because we we're, we're so beat up from whatever it must have been the week before or whatever it was. And um, things just kind of went our, went our way. And uh, yeah, we got New Zealand in the quarter and then always, always good to get a, a win against the Kiwis because we all know how difficult that is. And then we had England in the semis and I remember fully, fully scored with no time left kind of to put the icing on the cake. I remember Dougie was skinning people and uh Isaac Kay coming in off the bench, just like a huge impact in his first year. I remember that pretty, pretty vividly. And then, uh, man, the final, I remember the final, just we got up, we got, I had a dream start. Like we were up like 19 nothing in the first half. And then classic, uh, you just give Perry a sniff and he, and he, and he goes in for, I think he had a hat trick short, like very shortly into the second half. And then it's all square. And then Hammond scored with, geez, maybe like maybe two minutes left, not even two minutes left. And we just managed to, to grind it out. And man, yeah, what a feeling. And um, yeah, no, it's uh, definitely one of the highlights of my career and something that kind of, you know, I want that feeling again at, uh, at some point in my career. So that's kind of what, what drives me. So Mate, we've had a lot of North American battles, haven't we, in sevens and fifteens? And I can remember <laughs> playing against you back in the day on the series, uh, 07, 08, 09, around that time period. Now you have uh, amongst the most passport stamps, right? Because you've seventh most kept sevens player of all time. What's the secret, pal? What's the secret to the longevity? I don't know. So that's cool. Um, man, there's no secret really. I think I, for me, I just, the secret for me is just enjoying what I'm doing. You know, I still love going on tour. I'm as keen about it as I was when I was, you know, 21 and just really embracing the moment and enjoying the challenge of, you know, trying to prove ourselves as uh you know, I think that's kind of the thing with us as Canadian rugby players. I don't know if you could probably speak on it from the American kind of standpoint, but just kind of trying to, you know, prove ourselves in, on the world stage. And I think a lot of people assume because of where you're from or whatever team you are, you play with that, you know, you might not be kind of up for it. But I think, I mean, Sevens is a great example that that's not always the case, right? And I think um, that kind of that kind of drives me and keeps me keen to want to keep playing and, yeah, just take care of the body. And I don't think there's one thing. I think a lot of people would have different answers for you. I think other guys would say different things, but that's kind of the answer for me. No, I absolutely love it. It's and also such a pleasure to commentate to you now on the series, you know? So, Paul, we're love your work, on, man. Oh, you appreciate that. We're going to put you on the spot for a few questions. So, most difficult opponent that you've ever faced on the Sevens World Series? I'd say Ryder, William Ryder, like untouchable when he was playing. I mean, Jerry's pretty, I would, obviously Jerry's a nightmare to go head to head, head to head with. And I can imagine a one-on-one -on -one with the guy uh, in open space, but yeah, it's, for me, it's Ryder and it's, yeah, it's not even close. I think he had the kind of the speed and the, the jump step and he was kind of untouchable for a few years there. He certainly was. I, I hear you because I had to do my dream team, right, of all time. And Ryder was on the bench because he's a guy you, you come on step anybody on both sides of the ball. And I remember playing against him and getting just left behind and not clutching anything. I think I touched his jersey and that was an honor. Just to touch his jersey as he went past me. It's good. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I remember I lined up with him once in my first year and I'm like, oh, it's coming. And he passed it. And I was just like, oh, Great. you know, that was my, that was my. Yeah. Okay, so favorite try you ever scored? 
I haven't scored that many in like big, big moments. You know, I think probably one of the ones, you know, I scored a couple in Singapore against the Kiwis in uh, the quarter. That was, those were kind of ones that stick out for me. They weren't necessarily like fancy or any, any means, but just kind of be in the right place at the right time. I think those ones kind of stick out. It's my favorite tries. I'm not like Douglas running them in from 90, you know, or jogging them in. Yeah, jogging like, them in. If I get in from like the 22, I'm pretty pumped. I hear you. All right. Uh, you've played 15s and sevens, World Cups, Commonwealth Games, Pan Am Games. You've done it all what was your favorite moment in a canadian jersey so far i mean there's probably there's probably like three or there's probably three that stand out for me in particular would probably be my first cap was one winning singapore definitely definitely one and i think just qualifying for the for the games last summer is another those are the ones that really stick out for me you got a calm games and pan am games and yeah world cups and stuff are definitely definitely stick out for me but i think those ones in particular are the ones that stick out for me you could probably name a hundred of them with that career so fortunate to, to be around when you were coming through as a young man and then obviously seeing you growing into a, an old man like me catching up on me here now just kidding if you could what would you go back and say to the 10 year old nate hiriyama the first time you put a ball in his hand i would say just try to enjoy it you know try to enjoy enjoy playing and enjoy the moment because um i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily if 10 year old nate it went before i've chosen kind of rugby is my avenue i tell him not to pick uh one sport in particular until i kind of had to later on i think there's you know serious value in playing other sports and for me the big one's enjoyment you know and kind of enjoy the moment because you know before you know it i remember eddie fairhurst used to always say this to me when i was kind of the young guy on the team he's like man one day you're gonna wake up and you're gonna be the old guy on the team and it kind of it's, it's happened you know what i mean so I would just enjoy the moment. If you stop enjoying it, then maybe it's time to do something else. Let's maybe look at 16, 17-year-old Nate playing rugby. Was it McRoberts where you were playing? Yeah, McRoberts, and uh, I played junior rugby at Richmond. What would 15, 16-year-old Nate at Richmond Rugby Club say to, uh, to Nate now? If you could look into the, the globe and the magic globe and, and see what kind of man you turn out to be in an erupting BC place for the last four years and doing what you've done think it's one thing like when especially as you get older in your career you kind of learn to take care of your body a bit better and I might have been a bit more like reckless with certain things or kind of not do the prehab and things like that you I mean it's such a cliche you know it's such a cliche yeah I'd probably say something like that like I remember I mean, it's definitely just something to do with age as well. Like you don't have to warm. I remember, I don't remember warming up. I was like <laughs> mid twenties, you know what I mean? Or whatever, like not, not feeling good or whatever it is. But if I would have had that foresight as a younger guy, I'd probably be feeling, I mean, I feel, I feel great now, knock on wood, but uh, like that's what I would probably could have prevented some injuries along the way. And um well, I, I know there was a point after the 2011 World Cup, you weren't having fun, you know, to, to sit down with you nine years later or eight years later and, and see that you're still loving the game and your feedback to all those athletes out there is to enjoy yourself. Then that makes me really happy. I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of myself and Dallin for coming on the Rugby Hive today. And uh, I know every, all those listeners out there will, will be thankful to get an insight into Nate Hiriyama's brain. No, cheers, John. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And I uh, look forward to seeing the rest of you guys' pods. Nate, you're an electric eel, my friend. Can't wait to commentate you again. And you got to slip us a couple of one-liners and some more nicknames for uh, Robin here because the ferret, that's sticking. I love that. That's genius. <laughs> yeah, no problem, man. No problem. Love the, uh, the comment. More switches than electrician. I don't know where you, you guys think about that stuff before you say it. Well, so you, the truth. Think the, about those things. So, Nate, the truth of the matter is that there's, as a commentator, there, there's always two scenarios. There's a scenario that I know I'm going to commentate you this weekend, right? And I know that you're going to do something special at some point in the game. So I can pre-think about something, right? But then there's another thing where that happens on the spur of the moment and then it just comes to you. So the switches, that's kind of because you had this weird, this move just kept going. And so that like that, terrible, that, kind of, just... that kind of came through there. But some of them you can rehearse, particularly if you know, like let's say you're playing, you know, uh, New Zealand in the quarters, maybe they've beaten you 10 years before. So then you can, you can wait for that line when Canada wins something. But right, again, right. When, you, when you have the ball, you're always one of the special players that we know something's going to happen. So we have to have, you know, a little one line already. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Love your guys' work. Awesome, Stay safe. Pal. Stay well, guys. You too. Thanks, my friend. Yeah, thanks for Take care, me. you still. Cheers, care. buddy. Pal, listen, thank you so much for your time. And what we were just talking, we, you've been around since, I mean, before even I, I started and stopped and I've been doing something else for 10 years and you are still going. It's amazing. <laughs> man, I remember playing against you. Yeah, back in the I day. You had the gloves. You yeah, still have oh, the gloves. I know. Listen, I know. <laughs> I'm never, never going to live that down. And I, listen, a quick explanation. And randomly in South Africa, when I was growing up, at some point, like when I was, excuses, excuses. No, no, no. When I was in university, if you look at the guys that played then, like Brent Russell, Big Joe and Nick Cook, a lot of guys for some reason the gloves had come out that year, and I got given a bunch from them. And so then I don't know why I thought because I played in like Hong Kong or something. It was so so sweaty, as you know. 
I was like, the ball was very slippery. And I was like, oh, these gloves could come in handy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I should never have worn them anyway. So. But what happened to gloves? They just, they just van. I thought some guys would still wear them. I, I actually was thinking, I'm surprised no one's kind of brought them back. It, yeah. it actually could be an old old school thing because you're right. A lot of people did wear them for certain events, particularly like Singapore. Or, I, or I've got Dallin Stanford locked in for Halloween this year with the gloves on. <laughs> uh, just need a USA jersey. But uh, I remember we got a handful in George. I think probably your first time to George, and like Shane handed out a bunch because it was like yeah, they were like lines. Optimum or some weird brand, right? Yeah, yeah. and then uh, our captain was Dave Moonlight at the time, and he was just like, "Boys, you guys are not wearing those." Like. You can wear them to the bar, but that's about it. So we all wore them to the bar that night and like threw them away. Beautiful ball over the top. Yes, Seppo! Thank you for listening, you sleek sensations. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Rugby Hive Podcast and catch us on all the socials at Rugby Hive. We appreciate your support. Be safe out there and we'll see you soon. They've taken the lunch money from South Africa.